Okay, welcome everybody to the 2020 Architecture Summit for Golf Week Magazine. Uh, my name is David Normoyle. I'm one of three panelists along with Tom Dunn and Jay Blasey, and we're pleased to have you all here today. We had a nice afternoon playing the cradle in a scramble format, which I think was really nice because it meant that I didn't have to go chase my ball on the other side of all the greens and worked out even better. Uh, I'm here joined with, uh, up on the stage by Tom Pashley, who is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Pinehurst. Tom has been with Pinehurst for 25 years now and for the last five-ish years in his role as President. And we wanted to have a chance to talk a little bit tonight about architecture, for sure, but not just to be focused on the sort of digging of holes and filling them in, but also all the other elements that goes along with architecture. And, and sometimes that's the people who commission the architects and think about where they want to go uh, with the direction of a particular architectural experience. But first, before we get to that, Tom is an Augusta native. And so I wanted to get, before we get going, your reflections on the last week as an Augusta native. And I think also the intersection between uh, community and an event like the Masters and, and what you might have heard from friends and family in Augusta about what the scene was like in a November Masters. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I wasn't into, you know, gave me a curveball right out of the gate. So I'm, exactly I'm, right. I'm, now I'm playing defense. Um, <laughs> first of all, it's great to have you guys here. Thank you for, for traveling during these, you know, interesting times. Uh, it means a lot to us that you chose to be here and uh, we appreciate Golf Week continuing to promote the event, have the event, so great pleasure having you all here. Uh, yeah, I love being an Augusta native, uh, typically in the springtime, um, but this fall it's been a lot of fun. I, I, Augusta does just an amazing job with all their media, social media stuff, and so there was a video that they put out this year, you know, they put out hundreds of videos, but one that meant a lot to me was about kind of the outside the gates, the local Augusta experience and the restaurant workers and the the people who weren't renting their homes this year and just the pride that people from Augusta take in the fact that the most exclusive club in the world is in our backyard that we don't get to go to <laughs> any time however somehow it's still a positive you know the the the, the way that they are inclusive uh, during the tournament week I can remember as a kid you could call the pro shop and ask you know we wanted the green hats it was like a rope hat that had the big high crown um, and they would leave them at the gate you could just drive up and pick them up and pay for them at the gate so I mean they've, they've always been inclusive um, it, it is it is interesting to see I, I love what they're doing to lead within the game I, I didn't fully understand they made some announcement about uh, uh, the first T program that they're going to partner with. Uh, clearly, there was the Lee Elder announcement, which is fantastic. I think, and this it dovetails a little bit into our opportunity at Pinehurst and, and what we mean to the game, um, but I think they've really done a great job taking an active role in this whole grow the game concept. Drive, chip, and putt, they didn't have to do that. You know what? Mm -hmm. the, the women's amateur didn't have to do it. I mean, they, they are just knocking them out of the park. You now you can debate the golf course and the changes to the golf course and, and all of that stuff, but what they're doing with their platform, to me, is one of the most impressive things. And they're, they're, they're making a real difference. In, and I, again, I'm, I don't want to transition to us, but I think that's an opportunity that we have here as well to, to be more purposeful with some of the things that we do. I look, you guys got a chance to play the cradle today, and the cradle... <laughs> It just, it, it, it deserves a round of it, but the cradle yeah. is just so good, and, and we've done an amazing job kind of putting people through the cradle, but I think we still have a wonderful opportunity to use the cradle for good, and we haven't quite figured out exactly what that is yet, um, but it makes me think of Augusta. I, uh, I, I just am I'm such a big fan. Uh, so I, one of my best friends in grade school, his name is Steven Spencer, Turns out his dad was one of two head professionals yeah. at Augusta National. Dave and Barbara. Right. Yeah, there you go. One year, uh, when I'm like 12 years old, the Spencers, I don't know why. Why, did, why does Stephen always go to New York for the summer? I don't know. I don't get to see him in the summer. But they invite me to visit them in Long Island in the summer. And so I'm 12 years old, and I go out to Long Island, have no idea how I got there. I don't remember any of that stuff. But turns out he was the head pro at Maidstone. Um, 
in the in the summer months and so I got to spend a week homesick week you know probably crying most of the time um, being at Maidstone and I remember this these are great you know lessons for a parent I remember Mr. Spencer uh, had a, a huge box of multicolor teas and he gave Stephen and I the task to just sort them to the white ones. All he wanted was white. <laughs> Busy work. <laughs> and we also did a lot of time shoveling range balls in the, in the canvas bags. Um, I, I got a chance to go back to Maidstone like five years ago, the first time I ever went back, and it was not at all how I remembered. But, um, so when did you first become aware of architecture in that sort of context, having these interesting early experiences in golf? Yeah, I... I I, I do, my, my, one of my crowning accomplishments was my first par was at Maidstone on a, on a par three that has like a big hump. It's kind of a blind shot. Um, Number eight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't remember it, but, but I guess that was an exposure to golf architecture. Augusta was an exposure. I, I grew up playing at the Cabbage Patch, uh, which is the Augusta Municipal Golf Course, and Forest Hills golf club, which is a Donald Ross course, the, the two munis of Augusta. And during my time growing up there, you had Red Price and Red Douglas. We had the two Reds were the head pros at those two facilities. Um, and so I, I don't know when I began to pay attention to golf architecture. I loved reading all the Bobby Jones stuff uh, as an Augusta guy. Um, I came, you know, my first real golf trip was to Piners. My brother and I came to Piners in 1987 as I was graduating from high school. And uh, I'd never heard of Pinehurst. Uh, we, we showed up here, we had played, we played most of our golf. Once we graduated from the Immunis, we went to Midland Valley Golf Club in outside of Aiken and played a lot of golf at Midland Valley. We also enjoyed playing video poker and, and drinking <laughs> pitchers of beer. <laughs> Might not have been age appropriate at the time, but uh, so we enjoyed having fun, but we came to Pinehurst uh, and we had, you know, rolls of film. We took a picture of every hole that we played. And I remember being blown away by course number seven. Number seven was brand new, uh, just opened in 1986, I guess, right, Bob? And, um, and that, that, that par three is at 16, Reese's Fingers, there's this amazing, you know, just seeing the, the bunker work here blew my mind. Um, we played number two. Oddly enough, the first time we came, the greens had been aerified. <laughs> Bob Ferriner our head of agronomy back Who there. You'll hear yeah, from tomorrow night. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll get those notes from guests who might not have, maybe their friend forgot to tell them about the greens aerification. So I, I can relate to their disappointment when that happens. But anyhow, I'm rambling on after you asked me about Augusta. Um, but no, I thought it was, it was a, a great week for Augusta. And, and I love the, the slogan was the next two majors are the masters. I, I, I really think that's pretty cool. So, so many things go into a resort. There's rooms and food and beverage and service and all that. Why is golf course architecture important, you think, to the experience of Pinehurst? Um, hmm. You know, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I want to say Donald Ross. You know, I just want to say that, you know, Donald Ross is, is so important in golf course architecture. And I think, you know, for, for students of golf architecture, which I'm not one, um, you, you guys get it. Uh, but I remember the, one of the more interesting lessons that Gil Hance taught me about why does number two feel so natural and why didn't number four feel the same way, the previous version, pre, pre-Gill number four? Um, and Gill said to me, he's like, if, if you look around the greens of Pinehurst number two, and his, his summation was every green has a portion of that green at grade. You know, I think about walking up the first, the first green of Pinehurst number two, you get that huge swale, and, and you could think it's perched up because you kind of go down and then you come up. But when you get to the back of it, Oh my gosh, it's right there. It's a, it's a grade. Missing that green long is great, you know, but nobody ever does. Um, and so I, I began, you know, that, I think that's, it's the intangible. A lot of people, I don't know what percent of folks understand it um, and why they like a golf course, but there's so much that goes into why it feels natural, why you like it, why it feels organic to the sand hills. Um, and so I think it's just, it's part of, you know, golf architecture is just part of the Piners brand. It's the way you feel about the destination. Um, 
And so, you know, I, I find it interesting how other resorts, you know, some go all in on one architect in Wisconsin. Uh, others, you know, have such a great variety of architects. And so I, th I think it just adds, uh, you know, so many wrinkles to the overall experience. And, you know, sometimes we, we look back on some of the architecture that's happened at Piners, whether it's golf course architecture or, or building architecture, and you shake, you scratch your head a little bit, how did this happen, how did that happen? But it really is to think about the fact that you can come to Piners and you can walk through 100 years of golf architecture um, is, is something that you can't get anywhere else and you'll have such variety. Um, David, I would tell you, you know, I, th I think back to, I'm jumping right ahead, so uh, I think to the decision we made on Piners number four to totally, you know, redesign that golf course. So we, what, what was the tipping point? What, what drove that decision? Yeah, it was those, those pesky Bill Coor and Ben Crenshaw kind of forced our hand. They made number two so good. <laughs> they, they really did such a great job on restoring Piners number two. Well, maybe it might be worth talking a little bit about that decision and the process that went into the huge risk associated with taking yeah. something that worked and making it look very different. I wish, I wish Don Padgett were here tonight. Don Padgett was the president of Piners for 10 years. Uh, he came in 04 and retired after the U.S. Opens in 2014, and that was on his watch. And Mr. Bob Farron back there was also intimately involved in that project. But I, So I'm the head of marketing at the time, and, and really wasn't that involved in the decision. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you go back to the first U.S. Open, 1999, uh, the second U.S. Open, 2005, and this desire to have manicured rough, you know, varied heights, to have the ability to throw water in any direction that you want so that you can control exactly the, the lie. And so and, what was the origin of that thinking of manicured rough, lots of irrigation, different heights? Yeah, I, well, I guess, I guess that was the USJ US Open setup. Yeah, and, and I think at the time, this graduated rough was kind of a new concept. Graduated rough, the further you miss, the, the stiffer the penalty. Um, and so I don't re remember what year they began doing that or how that all began. But I think we, we kind of, we were, we were just so uh, focused on being able to provide great rough conditions, consistent rough conditions, all that stuff. And, uh, and so when you go back and look at some of the images from 2005, 2008, we've got a great shot of the, the seventh hole on Piners number two that shows the, the 1943 image, aerial black and white, and how wide it was. And then when you saw it set up for the U.S. Open, it was super narrow in 2005. But at the same time, we thought it was kind of cool. Why not leave those mowing lines like that so everybody gets to play a U.S. Open golf course? Doesn't seem like a terrible idea um, at and, the time. And what's the feedback you got from that? <laughs> well, and, and we didn't really have, you know, for normal resort play, there was not four inches of Bermuda grass rough. It might be at two inches. Yeah, so. Yeah, Bob will have his chance tomorrow to negate <laughs> everything I'm saying, by the way. Um, these, these, these are my recollections of the situation. But anyhow, the, the decision was made, and, and I think it was clearly, obviously, the right one to to take number two back. And mm -hmm. it had become a, ver a very manicured golf course, and the sandy wiregrass areas were, were ornamental. I remember you'd get to the... You get to the 12th hole on the right side of 12 or, or the right side of 11 and you'd find some sand and some wire grass and you'd be like, this is what Piners number two is all about right here. This is it. Just this little it, diorama. <laughs> this <is> little <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but and it was just it, the, the right side of, of the third hole was another one of those areas. But it, it had become so small and so pushed outside of the field of play that it was it was ornamental. And uh, so Don Padgett and Bob Dedman, our owner and I'm sure Bob Farron uh, decided that we needed to do something different. And we had, so we had just hosted the U.S. Open 2005. We were going to host the 2014 U.S. Open. And in the middle of that, Piners decides to hire Core Crenshaw to totally restore the, the golf course. One of our concerns at the time was, was feeling like people thought we were doing this for the U.S. Open, that this was a USGA thing. And it, it, clear, it was not. You know, the U we, we were... 
we were worried that it would mess up the U.S. Open. And so it, it was a wonderful collaboration, by the way, between Bill Coor, Ben Crenshaw, Mike Davis with the USGA, and Pinehurst to make sure we were all on the same page. Last thing Bill and Ben ever wanted was to restore this width and have you know the, the, the fairways bleed into the sandy waste areas and then have the USGA come in and grow up grow 10 yards of rough to narrow the fairways. So it was a great collaboration. Uh, it was a risk. Bob Dedman famously said, you know, this will either be the smartest thing we ever did or the stupidest thing we've ever done. Uh, and it turned out to be the smartest. And, you know, seeing it unfold was, you know, the, one of the primary pieces of equipment that restored Piners number two was a sod cutter. <laughs> and the amount of sod, 35 plus acres of sod, we joked that if you, if you owned a pickup truck and you were in Piners, you could drive on by and we'd load you up with, with a big, huge, it looked like a hay, hay bale of sod. Um, and I, they, they started out pretty conservatively. I, I remember Bill and Ben kind of nipping around the edges and trying to figure out, is this, is this too much? Is this not enough? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I don't know if he's here. I, I'm blanking on the gentleman's name um, that got the oh, photographer. Craig, Craig Disher. Yeah, Craig Disher uh, contacted Bill and Ben, and he had, you know, he, it, it wasn't like they were lost in the basement, but he had access to these images um, from 1943. I think it was Christmas Day, 1943. And, and once Bill and Ben got that, they got much more bold. <laughs> they began uh, taking out a lot more sod. Um, and it was scary. It was scary. I remember going out to, Bill Coor took me out to Dormy to see what it was going to look like eventually. Because I'm, again, I'm the sales and marketing person. I'm like, I don't get it. I, I just see, you know, hard pan. How is, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of growth. It, it, even when we planted the wire grass, it looked, it looked naked. It was just there. And so Bill took me out there and he said, Try, it'll be okay, Tom. It'll be, <laughs> it'll be just fine. Um, but it turned out to be, you know, the, the best thing. So, so Piners number two was widely hailed. And, and it was interesting because a lot of, again, you guys get it, but a lot of people need to be told something's good. You know, when you make a big change like that, people need to know that it's okay. So just uh, to add on that, what are some of the, th the pieces of feedback that you've gotten from general golfers that people who study architecture closely might be overlooking? I mean, what are the things that they really care about and are motivated by that, that we think are really important, but they, they sort of say, well, why did you do that? <laughs> Well, my wife is one who's like, why did you tear, you know, she would drive, she would drive by it every day. She's like, what did you guys do to the golf course? <laughs> and she's like, when are you going to finish it? I'm like, oh, it's finished. <laughs> it, 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 it's done. There is no more. You know, so I think it's that grass. It, it was, it, people had gotten used to seeing grass. And, and again, the, because the sand had become ornamental, they were not seeing a lot of the sand. Um, so I think that was the, the, the big one was just, you know, a lot of people, they thought that they preferred Bermuda grass rough, but I think as the, the playing conditions evolve, your ball moves forward. In, in Bermuda grass rough, it stops. But the ball is going to be 10 to 15 yards closer to the hole, and you know, 70 to 80 percent of the time, you're going to have a good lie in this in this sandy area. Um, so I think at first, people thought it was going to be harder. The the retail golfer or whatever, the normal golfer would think it would play harder, but I think they found out that it didn't, that, that hitting off of these hard pan lies, advancing the ball forward versus having it stop in Velcro uh, made it easier to play. So that was number two, and then you realized you had to do something with number four. Yeah, so the, the number two restoration happened in 2010-11. Um, you host the the back-to-back -back opens. Again, it's now championship tested. Uh, and, and its neighbor over there, Piners number four, its neighbor is sitting there with, at one time, 180 pot bunkers, um, or 180 bunkers, many of them pot bunkers. It was originally designed to be kind of a, a nod to Dornick. There was, there was a time when I think we considered calling it the Tribute was going to be the name of that. We were going to kind of give it a, a code name, the Tribute. It was a tribute to Ross. And so you had the the pushed up greens, you had the pot bunkers that were supposedly a nod to Dornick. I've not been to Dornick yet, so I, but the people who have say, eh, it's not really, <laughs> I'm looking at Jay, it's not really what it is. Um, so it, you just had this inconsistency of style. Um, 
And that's okay. We, we had some long, hard debates about, well, maybe, maybe Piner's number four is our finished, manicured, Quail Hollow style golf course or Augusta style, if you will. And may, maybe, you know, that's, that's what golfers want. They want to go play number two, have their Sandhills golf experience, and then we can give them a different experience on course four. So we talked, you know, at length about is that, is that a good thing? Should we provide that variety? And are we willing to have the maintenance protocols to present it that way? Um, which involves overseeding. Uh, Bob doesn't like when I even say that word, um, but it involved a lot of things. So we, in the end, we just decided, you know, we're, the old number four was kind of trying to swim upstream, as was the old number two. We were trying to be something that, that is not native to the sand hills. And so the decision was made to, uh, to take number four back. Now, you go through all this stuff. It's like back to what is it? Is it? It's not a. It's not the number two restoration. It's going to be a, a totally new golf course for the most part. The corridors will be the same. Um, and Gill, you know, we really didn't talk to anybody else. We just Gill was felt like Gill was the right person for that mm -hmm. job. And but he first did what you played today. He did the cradle first. So the cradle came before. Uh, the number two, the number four redesign, and I think it was great for for Gil to have a chance to kind of hone his Sand Hills aesthetic. You know, he really got to get in there on the cradle and decide what the Sand Hills is to him, um, and how to have that be reflected on Piner's number four. And I, I did, how many people here played the old number four, the Tom Fazio version of of course number four? So maybe half half the room. But, you know, what what you'll see tomorrow or the next day that I'd never saw before was these vistas. I mean, he just, the, 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 the ability to see, I think we determine it's 15 holes from one green. You stand up on the sixth green and you can see 15 different holes. Number four has these amazing vistas that I don't recall it having. And he took out a decent number of trees, but not, not like Oakmont. Um, and so number four has just been, it, it is now the perfect complement to Piner's number two. I think before, if I were to try to explain to you why, why we, you know, have this beautiful green pot bunker filled golf course over here that sits right next door to Piner's number two, I I'd be babbling more than I am now. Um, <laughs> but now it feels like it is the, the perfect complement to its big, big brother, big sister, big sibling, number two. An additional element to all of this is the relationship that Pinehurst has with St. Andrews. And going back to the beginning, if you walk through the hallway, you can see some of the early versions of the golf course. And there's this great quote where in 1898 that a nine-hole course, the first, was laid out after the famous St. Andrews near the foot of the village green. And the reason why I asked you the... Uh, the Augusta question and the sort of connection between community and an event is because what I think makes Pinehurst architecturally significant is that it's one of only four national historic landmarks in American golf. You have Oakmont, you have Marion, you have Baltusrol, and you have Pinehurst. But those are there just for the golf alone. Pinehurst is there because of the golf in part, but also the integrity of the village and the way that the, the sort of the two interact together. And when you think about the relationship with St. Andrews, it seems to me that it's not just having a bunch of courses. It's that relationship between the architecture of the courses mm -hmm. and the architecture of the place that connects it together. I don't know. That's much of a question, more of a statement, an observation. <laughs> Forgive me. But when you think about um, having a kind of aesthetic mm -hmm. architecturally to these places, um, where did you have that aha moment where you thought, yes, this is really who we are and this is where we ought to be going forward? At some point, and we love the St. Andrews comparison, we could go on about that, but I think at some point we, we decided Donald Ross built the original four golf courses at Pinehurst and we need to look at those four golf courses differently than the rest of them. And we need to try to have some sort of philosophy on, on how we present those golf courses. And so I think that was it. It was like the original four. Um, and, and, you know, things have happened over the years. And Richard Mandel's done a great job of kind of documenting how the courses have evolved and all that. Um,
But I think we just said, look, these are Ross's original, this, is, this land is where he laid out the original four, four golf courses in Pinehurst, and we need to be true to some sort of aesthetic. Now, we don't, the, 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 the balancing act, though, is so that they don't all, all look the same either. You know, we don't want to just, you know, what we've done on number three has, has brought back some of the sandy wiregrass areas, some of the, the features that were here. Uh, but, um, you know, you go out and people love going out on course number one and having this walk in the park. There's width, uh, there's a lot of turf. Um, and so trying to be true to, to a Ross aesthetic on all four of those courses, I think, was, was the tipping point for us. Um, back to St. Andrews for a moment, if you'd let me. The, I get a chance to travel to a lot of great golf destinations, and, and I, I have so much respect for people who create golf destinations. We're stewards of this destination. The Deadman family are stewards of Pinehurst, and they, they view their ownership of this place that way. Uh, and, and so we're, you know, as everyone says, it's easier to edit than to write, you know, so I don't like to, I'm not making light of our role here, but we, we didn't create Pinehurst. The Tufts did, and they did an amazing job. We're, we're just being great stewards of it. Um, but I think the, the new, some of these new places that don't, that have amazing golf, amazing golf architecture, but they don't have the village. They don't have the, the reality of residence. And you know, you don't go to some of these places, say, I think I could retire here. You, you can't belly up to the bar next to a local and begin a conversation and find out you're from the same town in New Jersey or wherever. Um, we get a lot of those here, no offense. Um, <laughs> And so I think that's, that's part of the charm of this place. It's a real place. It's a real town. It has real locals. It has kids who go to, to school here, people are raising their families here, Fort Bragg, got a lot of military folks here. So I just, and, and I'm sure in St. Andrews, again, it's the town. It's the mm -hmm. marriage of the golf and the town that makes it so unique. And so I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of this place, and I love to make fun of other places when I'm, you know, at a cocktail hour, uh, and, and I, I would have fun doing that. Um, but I think, you know, and you didn't ask me, but I think history is so important, clearly, to what we do. And sometimes when I go to these, these uh, newer, amazing resorts that don't have the history, and my, my playing partners start getting overly infatuated with it to my breaking point, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say... You know, it's too bad Hogan never got to see it here. <laughs> That's one of my favorite lines. That's very good. <laughs> Especially if I'm gazing off into the ocean. But like, I don't know if he was an ocean guy or not, but he loved Piners number two. It's too bad Hogan never got a chance to see it. Um, but so I, I'm Well, I'm one of the, big, the big decisions architecturally when you're thinking about the development of the aesthetic of those four original courses was the decision to break up the central element of the four original courses, which is what became the cradle. So in your 25 years here at Pinehurst, put the cradle into context, both the decision to do what you did with it, and then ultimately what is meant to Pinehurst as a consequence. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is incredible. It is incredible on 10 acres of land, you know, we have, X thousands of yards of golf holes, and it's those 789 yards on 10 acres that, in my opinion, has done more to kind of reinvigorate Pinehurst than anything we've ever done. Um, and so everybody wants to know, and, and we're, we are uh, very humble around here, and everybody's like, whose idea was it to build the cradle? Um, and I truly don't know. I, I would tell you, so Bob Farron's in the room again, and, and he gets a tremendous amount of credit. Bob Dedman, our owner, has always, you know, wanted to have a short, we should build a par three course. We've been talking about it for over a decade before we built it. Um, and we just never knew the right place to put it. And, and so we, over 10 years ago, acquired the former pit golf course. Uh, and, and we had 700 acres that was surrounding it that was going to be the, the old number nine and 10 when we were going to build those two new courses back in, in the early 2000s. Um, but so we always said, well, we could do, we could build the most amazing golf course on this thousand acres of land, a, a, a par three course unlike anything that the world has ever seen. Um, but no one's going to, you know, the only people who are going to see it are going to be the ones down there. So we just always resisted the temptation to build it down there because it just didn't feel like it was the right place. And 
I would tell you, one of the defining moments for me in the cradle's creation was a little change we made to Piner's number one many years ago. Piner's number one finished on a fairly nondescript par three hole right at the clubhouse. And Don Padgett again and Bob Farron made the decision that we didn't want that course to end on that hole. So they went in, in my mind, miraculously and found another hole. You know, they created a new par three within <laughs> a landlocked golf course, which then allowed us to do something different with that finishing land. And, and that's part of our practice facility now. So they found a new hole within a landlocked golf course. So I think when we, at some point, Bob, <laughs> Here's the other part of the cradle's creation. We were, we were looking at those original two holes, parallel, par fours, and said, well, you know, we could cut some greens in behind these bunkers. These fairway bunkers are sitting here. We could, we could create three or four different greens in addition to the two greens on the real holes. And maybe in the afternoons, we could just turn it into a little par three experience. That'd be kind of unique and kind of fun. But it just felt a little forced. It felt like, well, what if you want to play the real course and all these knuckleheads are out here playing the short yard, you're going to have to, by the time of day, set it all up. So I give all the, if, if, if Bob Farron didn't want to do it, he could have said, we can't, we can't remove two par fours and find a way to squeeze them into two existing golf courses. That's, now I thought it was amazing to find a par three within course number one, but he went out and found a couple of new holes um, and that, that was wrought with, with consternation of Piner's number three is a Donald Ross golf course. Mm. Um, and can we go in and turn it into a par 68? Will the world allow us to do that? Um, will we get haters? Will the detractors show up and will people chain themselves to the trees or whatever? <laughs> um, but we, we felt like the, the product, the, the finished product of the cradle will be well worth whatever compromises that we're having to make on the golf course. And thankfully, uh, it's been so well received. I can remember um, somebody came up to me. Piners, by the way, has a, a great Piners Country Club with 4,500 members. And, and of those 4,500, about 1,500 of them were golf members. And one of, the, one of the golf members came up to me and said, we don't need a par three course. Why are we building a par three course? We don't, we don't need that. And I was, I was just, I had to say, well, you know, Piners completes, competes on a global stage. We're, we're competing for golfers who are considering going to this place, that place, that place. So even, even the members uh, who we thought would, would be against it have, have loved it. And some of them are here tonight. And, uh, and so what it's done for us has been to <laughs> one of the bellmen checked checked somebody in a, a couple months ago and I was with him and the person that he was helping with his bags was wearing a t-shirt and shorts and the guy said can I go over and, and put on the putting green like this you know he was wearing a t-shirt and shorts and our bellman said absolutely we we take our golf seriously but not ourselves and I, I heard I heard Ryan Cadell say that line and I was like I'm I'm so going to use that again because <laughs> I think we were perceived to be kind of a serious place in a place that is all about history. And we were a, a golf museum, a living museum, but we were a golf museum. And, and I think the cradle plus the deuce and plus a bunch of other things, this will do, but the cradle more than anything else allowed us to be kind of cool and allowed us to show that we don't take ourselves too seriously. We have plenty of statues and, and, and brass plaques and, trophies out the you know it, and we're so proud of it we would we'd be nothing without it however we get that the game's evolving and we need to evolve with it and so the fact that there's music being played out there on the cradle by the way I was out there on Thistle Dew today there was some just awful song on while you guys were out there I don't remember what song it was we stress about the playlist and I, ha I skipped it you know so if you heard one mid mid song skip that was you I, I go back and find yeah um, <laughs> but the fact that you can play barefoot the fact that you can, can listen to music, that you've got the pine cone uh, where you can go get a cocktail, suddenly it's like, this place is kind of cool. This is kind of fun. And, and you can bring your, your non-golfing spouse here. You can bring your non-golfing kids here. And everyone can go out there and, and have fun on the cradle and not be intimidated. Um, I used to joke about, you know, people will come here and not play golf. And I would say, you don't go to a vineyard and not try the wine. You, you've got to roll a golf ball. So whether it's just this will do or it's just the cradle, um, it's been 
off the charts. You know, we, 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 <laughs> we're, we count about 35,000 rounds a year on the cradle, but there's countless replays that we don't count. So we're probably playing 40 plus thousand rounds a year on that cradle. And, to and see how does that compare to everywhere else in the area in terms of a round count? I mean, is, does that put, is that the most played course in the Pinehurst area? I think well, I think we just anointed it. Says David Normoyle with well, Golf know. Week. <laughs> no, no, I I think it, it probably is. Um, we 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 play forty thousand rounds, I would imagine, on a couple of our courses. Um, but no, it's 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 got to be the most played course. And to look at the conditioning of it, you know, the most I, I'm asked two questions most often. The first is, do you think USGA will do back-to-back -back opens again? You know, next time <laughs> it's their call. We'd love it if they do. Uh, the second question is, are you going to light the cradle? Um, and so part of me feels like it needs a rest. Let's let that. I mean, the conditioning for 40,000 plus rounds is phenomenal. And they're wedge shot. I mean, they're all, they're all coming in, um, leaving a ball mark. And uh, the conditioning is so good on the golf course, considering the amount of play that it gets. Um, but all the credit in the world goes to Gil and Jim Wagner, Gil Hans and Jim Wagner, because... We don't over instruct our, our golf architects. You know, that was all on them. And I, I can remember Gil came with two routing, two, two plans. One was like a five hole legitimate par threes, you know, anywhere from 150 to two, who knows what it would have been. So he says, I've got a five hole plan that's got, you know, legitimate par threes, and I've got a nine hole plan that's got just fun, shorter. And I remember saying, I was like, I don't even want to see the five. I, I don't, who wants to play a five? I'm not interested in even looking at that plan. So that is the lost routing. <laughs> there it is. One day someone will find the Somebody, lost routing. Somebody's going to do a podcast about <laughs> what it was um, supposed to be. But all the credit to Gil. We said, I remember saying, could, could someone play it with just a putter if they wanted? And that, that felt like it was maybe an important thing to be able to say if we wanted to reduce the intimidation factor. And, and we thought if it could be fun for a scratch golfer, it could be fun for a beginner um, and fun for kids, we could hit a home run. But it felt like a lofty goal. It's like we can't, we probably won't be able to get all three of our criteria. Um, and so and just what were the three again? Beginners, scratch, yeah. and families. Yeah. Um, and so he, you know, knocked it out of the park. And I think, you know, Gil would tell you that's, as far as, you know, achieving the goal, that's probably the best project that they've ever been associated with because it, it has achieved the goal that we had. And others are, are, you know, it's fun to see others try to emulate it and, and have their own version of it. And there is no formula. I think the, the secret ingredient that we have is location. I mean, it is just so fun and cool to be out there. You're, you're being seen, you're seeing others, you can see all nine holes from the same place. To be at This Will Do and to be at the cradle is to be part of the celebration of golf right now. And, and so I think the aesthetic, I, one of my favorite places in the world is Shinnecock Hills, and I, love, I just gaze at the clubhouse wherever I am on that property. I'm always looking at it. And you get a little bit of that out on the cradle. You're, you're in the shadow of this amazing building. Gil says you're on the front doorstep of Pinehurst. Um, so you can, you can try to, you could take that, that exact thing and plop it, plop it out at the pit, and I, I have no idea what that would be like. I don't know that anybody would go down there for it, um, but because it is where it is, absolute home run. What other advice do you have for all the places that are thinking of doing short courses? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's <sighs> I just came back from, from Bandon a couple weeks ago, and I, I played Preserve. And that's so much fun. You know, it, that is great. I find it a little long now. You know, it's like, it, it just depends. It, it just depends on what your goal is. If, if your goal there is to, for the people who can't play 36 a day, can't walk 36 a day, give them another, another you know, experience that might take a couple of hours. Um, I've not been to Sand Valley yet to see the Sandbox, um, to see what theirs is all about. But... I think it's about location and it's about kind of the, the vibe. Um, so we keep looking for ways that the music was not part of our original recipe for the cradle. Music was kind of added on, on opening day. 
media day, if you will, we, we had speakers set up on the first tee just to kind of create a, this is an event, so we're going to have some music. And it became part of the, the folks who wrote about it, Golf Week and others, would write about uh, music was playing. Gil, Gil's a big Grateful Dead guy, and, and there was a song. I'd never heard of the band. There's a band called Cage the Elephant, and apparently we played a song by Cage the Elephant that day, and he, he mentioned that in some of his press notes. And suddenly, you know, that, that sounded kind of cool, that this place plays music. And so we, I don't know how long after, Bob, it might have been six months to a year after it opened that we actually wired it for the speakers. Mm. Um, so I would say, you know, the, the, what do you do if you're another place looking to build a short course? Um, you got to put it in the absolute right destination. You've got to make it fun. You got to allow eight sums, um, but you also you also can't let it get away from you. I, I, I look sometimes in the afternoons on what's going out on the cradle, and it's on the edge. I would tell you right now, it's <laughs> on the edge <laughs> of you know. Do I want to bring my family out here? <laughs> not Friday, not Friday <laughs> afternoon at six o'clock. Um, and so Michael's laughing because we, we were out there. So you just you, you've got to figure out what it is you want, and and we're still figuring that out with the sure. cradle. And and I want to find a way to make it do more good. You know, we the we get you know countless requests to donate golf courses for charity events and that kind of stuff. And so right now, I'm, I, when we get those requests, and it's one that we want to seriously consider honoring, I'm pushing them more towards the cradle. And we did a thing with the Boys and Girls Club recently. And yeah, we can do something with the first tee, and it's a great organization, but they have golf access. The Boys and Girls Club had you know, a foursome of adults play with one of the kids from the Boys and Girls Club who would never in a normal course of you know their life go out and walk on a golf course. And so getting them out on the cradle seemed like a really good idea. And I'm really proud of that. So I think, you know, whatever these short courses can do to bring more people into the game, again, as a as a business leader who's, who whose arm gets twisted for a thousand dollars for a foursome, and it's a it's a lot of your time to go do it. Would you rather spend an hour on the cradle and, yep. and move on, or would you rather spend four and a half hours out on a real golf course? Um, so we're just scratching the surface with what I hope we're eventually able to do on the cradle. Big recent news is the USJ's announcement of having a second headquarters here, and I think along with that, the designation of Pinehurst as an anchor site, the first anchor site for the US Open. How much do you think that the decision to restore number two plays into that, and what do you think that, that new status as an anchor site means for the future of architecture at Pinehurst? Yeah. I. I I am certain that not only the decision to do number two, but number four and, and the cradle and everything, you know, the fact that Pinehurst is in the center of the golfing universe, and we always have been, but now more than ever, we feel as relevant as any golf destination in the world. So I think, yeah, I think being who we are, having evolved the way we have over the last 10 years, certainly has played into the USGA's desire to be here. Um, Another small little factor, when you, if you guys go out to number eight, you'll see that Golf Pride has their global headquarters just inside the gates of Pinehurst number eight. It's not on the golf course. It's a perfect, it, you know, they wanted to be in the, in the vortex of, of golf. They wanted to be uh, able to, to put their prototype grips in the hands of golfers on the driving range at number eight. And so I think they were one of the first ones to say, wow, we, we should find a way to work with Pinehurst Resort. Um, and so the fact that the USGA, you know, they, I, I toured Golf House maybe just like a couple of years ago. They had, they had totally moved everybody out for two years into temporary office space. They rebuilt their total headquarters, um, perhaps shortly after the Fox deal was done. And, but they didn't do the test center. And so the test center... Might have, you know, it's like moving into your new house with your old furniture, maybe. You know, suddenly the, the headquarters was gorgeous and you had the old test center and maybe it didn't feel the way it, it, it didn't feel appropriate given the status of the organization. Um, and so they knew they needed to rebuild it somewhere. And, and I, to their credit, they decide it doesn't have to be in New Jersey. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to have a 400 yard driving range for Iron Ruggy or Iron Byron. <laughs> um, and so, 
at first, when we first began talking to the USJ, we were pitching them on the pit because we thought they needed over 300 yards of, of driving range. But when, when they said, no, we really don't need, we don't need 300 yards. We can do it with photography. And only a couple times a year will we actually need to hit physical balls on the range, which we can do on Maniac Hill, um, that that beca became a reality. The state of North Carolina was a huge supporter. They, they, they attracted them with an incentive package that's gonna make it very, very easy for the USJ to build that facility here. Um, I think, so it's, it's not only the test center, but it's their green section. And you know, one of the most exciting things, and I don't know if it's, it's true or not, but I'm told they're researching uh, a, a Bermuda grass that will stay green year round. And to think that the group that's researching that is gonna be here, and they're gonna be working with our agronomy team on different projects. Uh, I think it, again, it, it goes back to St. Andrews. For me, it goes back to St. Andrews in that you've got the old course, you've got the RNA, and and I forget why am I why am I well, They have the test center there too, the Allen Robertson right turf grass. And so Piners will have Piners number two. Oh, it's the the Open Championship. That's what right. I was. That was my third missing ingredient. Every five years, you get the Open Championship. And so for us to have a U.S. Open every five to six years. A physical presence of our national governing body and Piners number two uh, is going to be a super compelling uh, package. I love the fact that, you know, I hope they're not going to be here trying to tinker with Piners number two. You know, the beauty of Piners number two right now is that you don't have to do anything to get it ready for the open. We used to talk about, you know, you got to begin narrowing the fairways 18 months out or however far out you have to begin narrowing the fairways and you got to start growing the rough up and, and so you're creating a a, a false reality, you know, you're creating something mm -hmm. that doesn't exist the rest of the year, but now, on Piners number two, you get to play a U.S. Open course every day, uh, except for the firmness and speed of the greens. Uh, so, I think it is a, it's a huge validation for us about the path that we're on, that they would choose to, to be with us. I think it speaks again to the Deadman family and their stewardship and ownership of Piners, that, you know, this is a long-term Long-term commitment. If we were if we were owned by a private equity firm, um, I don't think this would have happened. But mm -hmm. we're we're owned by a family that considers themselves stewards of the the place, and so the USGA is willing to make that long-term commitment. So a couple of final questions, architecture-related. If you had to take one hole from Pinehurst and put it in your backyard at home, and it's where you could go and play golf after work, and it's where you could share it with friends, and it, most importantly, it's where you would show people who don't understand what makes golf a good game, why they should like it too. What hole from Pinehurst would you take and put in your backyard? Wow. <laughs> uh, man, oh man. I think I'd... I remember doing a little video with, with one of our famous caddies, Willie McRae and Eddie, Eddie Mack. And uh, they, I asked him, what's the easiest hole on, on Piners number two? And I said, is it the third hole? You know, it's a, it's a short hole. And, and Willie was just like, there are no easy holes on Piners. A lot of people think that one's good. So I'm going to go with the third hole of Piners number two because it's not about length. Um, it's got that, that beautiful kind of infinity green that rolls off the back and so but you can again to guilt it, it you walk up the front it's right at grade um it's got all the the sandy wiregrass areas you'd like to have i love the sandy cart path down the left hand side i love our sandy cart paths um it's got plenty of is 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 mr nicholas would say you know it's a tree-lined hole where trees don't come into play mm -hmm. um, so you see plenty of, of lumber out there but for the most part you're not going to have to interact with any of the lumber. Um, so I would, and I, I have a, a modest home, so I, that's a shorter hole. I should have gone maybe with a par three to fit in my. For the sake of this, you could put whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I would have Ross's home right there. So, so we, uh, we acquired the, the Dornick Cottage a couple years ago. So Ross lived right off that third green. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun to sit out there and wonder what he was thinking and, and, Imagine what was going through his mind as he was making all the changes to his masterpiece. Good. Any thoughts, 
just for us as we go to to think about uh, playing for number course number four tomorrow and course number two, what we should keep in mind if it's our first time, haven't played before. And it's number two tomorrow, number right? Four tomorrow. Okay, number four two. tomorrow. We'll go low tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> go to tomorrow's scoring day. Uh, I think of the U.S. Amateur. Um, where they played both two and four in, in stroke play for qualifying, and scoring average was maybe three and a half to four strokes higher on two than it was on four. Uh, so four is your respite. Four is, is you know, the, the, the greens are, are accepting of your errant shots more so than you'll find them on, on Pinehurst number two. I love the green complexes, of course, four. They just sit, you know, they, they sit on the ground. There's a lot of run-ups. I love the... The third hole on course four has this such a cool, I had no idea it was a, a, a rectangular or a rectangle green um, until somebody took a drone image and I saw it. And it's got this great mound on the right hand side that distorts your field of vision to understand that it's a, a geometric shape. But you can run the ball, you have to run the ball into that green. Um, No, I, I just find you know, like I said, number number four is such a great compliment to number two now. But it's a it's a it, it's a great introduction to you to Piner's architecture and Piner's aesthetic. And then number number two is your final exam, and that Gil talked about that. Number number two is the the stern test, as mm -hmm. it should be, as it should always be. Uh, but number four is is uh, advanced course, um, but it's much more welcoming. One of the challenges that we have is we're often usually asked to give our opinion about a golf course after playing it just once. And it's something we kind of have to move beyond and dissociate ourselves from our score and really think about it. Mm -hmm. How many rounds did it take for you to feel like you finally got course number two, where you came to understand how to play it for yourself? And that presumes that I've... <laughs> um, it probably took me 25 rounds to for my heart to not be beating so fast and not to worry about putting off of every green to, to, to know a little bit more about where to miss. I, I, I'm super uncomfortable when I go to Tobacco Road because I still don't know where to miss. I don't know it well enough. And, and so knowing, maybe I'm, I'm a, that's a terrible mentality of knowing where to miss, but that's what I need in order to shoot 82. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as a three He's being handicap. Very modest. Yeah. No, so I'd say 25 times, which is, it's so unfair for a, a person who only gets one crack at it. And, and I've, you know, this isn't launching a new uh, ad campaign, but I, I, I want to tell people, you know, don't, don't you dare put us on your bucket list because you should come here more often than that. Um, you know, there, there is no reason. We have four seasons. We have three different hotels. There's a lot of different ways to come here. And so we want to encourage people to, to not consider this a bucket list trip, that this is just your your Piner's trip, and you should do it more often um, and understand the subtleties of, of the, the Ross masterpieces that you're going to get to play, not tomorrow, but the following today. Good. Well, with, with that, thank you yeah. very much, Tom, for all of your time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think, Armin, that concludes uh, our plan for this evening. We, due to the current state of things, don't have big dinner plans for you and all that sort of stuff, but we'll see you tomorrow morning. Check your tea times. 8.30 is the first starting time, and then uh, we'll gather tomorrow afternoon, again here. The first session about uh, storytelling at Pinehurst will be at 4.30, and then the second session with Bob Farron and Robbie Zalznick talking about championship course setup will be at 6 o'clock. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much.